Hi everyone, welcome to this new episode of Carolyn Talks. This is the podcast slash YouTube channel where I, your host, Carolyn Hines, film critic and journalist, speak to film creators around the world about their work, the industry, and what inspires them. And today is one of my special interviews for the 2024 South by Southwest Film Festival. And I'm very happy to be joined by the creative team of We Were Dangerous. I think a film that talks about colonialism and colonization from the female perspective. And it talks about the dangers of West of Western Christianity and religious and religious fundamentalism in a way that I haven't seen. And I can't wait to talk to them. So joining me today is director Josephine Stuart Tefu. If we ask, I, I had it closed. Josephine Stewart, if we really good <laughs> producer Morgan Waru and writer Maddie Dye. I yeah. was so sure that I had it said right in my yeah. head. So sorry. <laughs> and um, first of all, thank you, ladies, so much for joining me. I'm very excited about this film and for talking with you about it. Good, thank you for thank having you. us. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So one of the first questions I have to ask, I'm going to ask, this is a question directed at both Maddie and Josephine. So when this film started, the first thing that came into my head was the 1996 film, Madeline. And the, and like, you know, it's the little girl who, you know, like she goes to the, um, the boarding school and, you know, she meets up with like the, 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 um, Miss, Pe Miss Penny and all the kids. And it kind of has this surrealist fantasy element at the beginning. So I want to ask you both about constructing the story that way because it makes you think almost like this is going to be a happy story. You know, it's going to be about adventures. It's going to be about girls bonding and having fun. And then you realize quickly, yeah, no, this is a horror story, actually. And <laughs> so talk to me about crafting the film in this way where it sets the audience up for one thing. And then you're just like, nope, I'm going to switch it up on you. Why don't you go first and talk about the script and then I'll talk about Okay, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I... I mean, playing with tone and sort of like inserting the like a comedic with the dark and the, the light and the tragedy was like always a big goal for us. And I think also talking about teenage girls and not having them just be sort of like sulky and rude brats, but have them be sort of like, I don't know, like thoughtful and like spirited and adventurous and um also like display great solidarity for each other and like deep feeling like it was really important so I guess to me actually like in a story that centers on a bunch of teenage girls it actually felt like a, a natural starting point like that's their sort of like most natural state and then the world they exist in is much more complicated and dark than that and and that's like reflected in the story but yeah I, I that yeah that felt that felt right for her I think yeah otherwise. I think Maddie writes with a real, like, beautiful sort of fable quality to to her work on this particular script. And so I think that's where some of these, like, um, references, like it reminded you of Madeline, sort of come in. Naturally, you do want to um, shoot it and make the film in a way that sort of feels reminiscent of those worlds. And once I think the audience feels safe, we're going to take you on a journey. Like, actually, we're going to turn this whole thing on its head and we're mm -hmm. going to have a play. And we're going to show you a different side or point of view perspective of, of this world. Mm. And yeah, the story, I want to, we're going to talk a bit about this, of the story of colonization and religious fundamentalism in it. But something I want to really talk to all three of you about, because I am from Barbados and I went to an all girls secondary school. So I'm very familiar with the environment of a place just dominated by women. You have both the student body as well as the teachers. You might have like a few men who might be a teacher or like the custodian. And when I saw that setup, I'm like, yes, I know this. I know this setup. But and the way how like we talked a bit about ha having a fable element to it and like the setting of the audience to believe it's a fantasy or this going to be this happy-go-lucky um, environment. And I think part of it is because a lot of people have this misconception that any place dominated by females, especially by young girls, is going to be just like, you know, play, you know, like the girls are going to be just happy doing like the hand games. We did those too. But then it's going to be, it can have a very dark side because girls can be very dark. Girls can be very vindictive. Like we can be like bullies that, you know, they can be just as violent as boys are. And the film shows that. But I, so I want to talk to the three of you about showing that side of the female, um, not only from a female identity, not only as a community, but individually, because each of these girls are very complex and very layered. 
But you talk about how in that comes how that comes into play as a community aspect because you have all of these identities converging in one location, one isolated location, and that is like setting up a recipe for disaster. So I want you to talk about that. So, but Morgan, I want you to, I want you to talk about that in with regards to the casting and like working as a producer and bringing this film together. But so I want you to go first to talk about just like getting this element of the film together. Like you have this story that is about basically all female characters coming together and like your perspective as a producer and saying, how are we going to make this work? Mm, I, that's such a good question. And it's so interesting to hear you bringing your experience to the film, having been to an all girls, um, being to an all girls school. Cause I think it's so, um, it's so, it brings so much to your experience of the film. So it's so interesting for us to, to hear, to hear that. And, the casting process for the film was um, was really organic and collaborative, and um, we just yeah we just wanted it to be the the best actors for the role. And Joe's had a couple of really great people in mind, and it, it was really um, it yeah it came together really organically. But I just want to speak to what you were talking about with the um, the representation of teenage girls on screen because I think it's true that it can be very reductive quite a lot of the time and what was so beautiful about um, Maddie's script and the way Joe brought that to life was all, all the details in the fabric nothing was kind of reduced to one girl being a bully or one girl being the bimbo or one girl being this or that because it's not that reductive in real life. And I think the context that Maddie picked for the story is what the pressure and the tension is on this kind of downward pressure on these young women who are just trying to make friends and be slightly disinterested in this benevolent ideology that's being exacted upon them. So it it's, yeah, it's a very interesting space to be telling stories about young women yeah yeah and for you can go you can go next josephine okay um to add on yeah i would agree with morgan the casting process was really collaborative between myself and morgan we and our casting director we worked quite closely trying to um figure out who was the who were the best actors for these roles mm -hmm. um in terms of what you said about the girls i think you know, Maddie and I both, we went to different schools, but we both went to all girls schools, which is very normal in New Zealand. Morgan didn't, which is quite unusual, actually. It's quite common in New Zealand that um, for secondary school, you're separated by sex. Um, and yeah, I, I, I remember standing, we had to stand every time the principal entered the room. There were very strict rules around yes. etiquette and conduct. That's just, it, it's the same in the Caribbean. We have the very, because like, it's a British, it's based off of the British school system. So like yes, the etiquette correct. system is the same. So that is a very real world for yeah. both of us. We both have lived that, that world. But I would say like for the girls, it was actually a really deliberate choice for us not to like archetype any of our characters in the film into these roles like one's the bad one one's the the, the bully one's the, the, the sweet cute one like it, it was so important to us that every single girl at the school had a life and a character that was as rich as and complex as you know male roles that you might see on screen it, it's it's so important that we reflect back to particularly young women who watch this film how they see themselves and how they see the world around them. And yeah, that was a very deliberate choice. And it very much started with Maddie and her writing of the script and that idea we carried through in the making of the film and in the post-production of the film. Mm. Mm. So yeah. the film focuses on three girls in particular, Nellie, Daisy, and Lou. And they, like, as you were saying, I'm just thinking, like, they, they don't fit in particular character archetypes. So they want Nellie is, she's like the leader but she's also, but she also knows when to step back when it's necessary. She can be strong, but she's also naive in some aspects, and she, she's not, she, she's very reactive. Like there's Daisy, who seems like the sweet one, and like she seems like very like airheadish almost. But you realize it's because I, she, I think she's like me. I'm dyslexic, so I was like, is she dyslexic? Does she have a learning disability? You know, and that. 
but that allows her to see things in a very different way than everyone else. Like, you know, she looks at the world in a, almost like a very literal sense, which again is like me. And then there's Lou who comes from, who's white, who comes from a very, um, a very affluent background. And, but that doesn't mean that she's snobby, you know, she's not bougie. She doesn't use that as a way to look over the other girls. So like these girls are all like very complex and very layered. And I love that you did that for them. And I was doing some research because I was, very curious to know if New Zealand had residential schools like they did like they did here in Canada like it's for Canada had the residential schools or as I prefer to call them forced assimilation institutions for indigenous students and I was doing some research because the film is about is about that in a in a general sense you know like these place the place that the girls are taken to could be looked at as a forced assimilation institution and while I couldn't find anything specifically about that in New Zealand, I did find that New Zealand did have um, a pretty big movement with regards to eugenics and with forced sterilization. That was it was something that was on the books to become law. So Maddie, talk about in putting that into the story and making this story about that, but from the female perspective, because the readings that I found focused mainly on forced sterilizations of boys and with the, and like schools for about the mentally ill and you know. And from again for boys, but I didn't find much for girls in particular. So talk about making this story about girls. Yeah, well, yeah, I like you did research uh, about New Zealand's history of eugenics at some point, and was sort of like fascinated because that's like a part of our past. That at some point there was like a great deal of support in the general population for programs of forced eugenics, um, and that was something I had no idea about. Um, and and that features in the script with this um, book called The Fertility of the Unfit, which was written by a New Zealand politician in 19. William A. Chapel. I looked up his name. A. Chappell, yeah. Who I think um, also was in the like House of House of Commons in, yeah. in Britain. So you know, like I mean, that's like, I assume was not that uncommon to be in the upper echelons of like both worlds. But um, and. But yeah, in terms of sort of the female element, the, the film set in the 50s and around that time in 1953, there was this moment of like great moral panic about the sexualization of young women. And it, it came from like the availability of contraceptives at the time and the fact that mothers were now working more. And th this idea that like it was women who were pursuing men. And so I guess sort of like, yeah, the, the general context of these ideas sort of it gave light to uh, elements in the story although it's fiction it's sort of like pulling out parts of our history that I I had no idea about and, I mean I don't know if you did that they just sort of felt like we've we've tucked away um yeah but those um those schools did exist in New Zealand um my dad went to one he was in mm -hmm. one whole childhood and although um it was never said that it was for um, people of colour. Um, the majority of the students were Pacific Island or Māori, who are the Indigenous people of New Zealand. So yeah, I, yeah. So they was taken off his mum as a baby and raised in state boys' homes. Mm, I thought it was important also to have the film be from the young female perspective because I watch films about this, uh, this subject topic, but usually they were, first of all, written and directed by men and focus on male characters and, and like adults. But I thought it was interesting to have it from the young female perspective because, and then basically have the antagonist be an older woman. And an older woman who I guess you could say is almost racially ambiguous. And like that only comes through in a very, in a line where she lets it sit we, you mm -hmm. know, we Maori. And I thought that was a genius moment because for the entire time of the film, it makes you, she makes you think, well, she's a white woman suppressing these girls. And then you realize when she says that, yes, this is actually internalized racism. You know, this, this is how assimilation works. She is the definition of racial assimilation into an identity that is not your own culturally and, and indigenously. So I, when I, when that moment happened, I was like, this is so clear. I'm like, and I thought like her casting in particular was genius because she has that lily white hair and she's wearing all white through the entire film. And I'm like, yeah, she's embraced whiteness from her head down to her toes. So I want yeah. you to talk about like in making the story subversively, um, subversively about white superiority and assimilation, and how white um, superiority and the use of religion suppress indigenous identity among the Maori people. Because I did some research last year for another piece where 
there was a, a there is this very famous set of photo photographs where people use them talking about Maori people. And this a photographer did some restoration. This and you re realize they had their tattoos, their traditional tattoos on their faces. And for years, no one knew that they had tattoos because the Aboriginal pictures had been basically tin plated to hide the tattoos. And then like there was this big study on how like back in the days, this is how they actually encourage people to stop doing traditional tattooing because it's you look like this. This is what assimilation looks like. So I thought this film kind of like show that from a different perspective where she doesn't have the traditional tattoos because she's put on this facade. So I want all three of you to talk about making a film like this of basically about calling out um, religious fundamentalism, but also white supremacy in very subversive, um, subversive ways. Because I think it's my favorite thing about the film. I'm like, yes, tell these white people about themselves. <laughs> I mean, I can only speak from my perspective as um, a Māori woman who's quite white looking too and possible to be white if I need to. Um, but, you know, gosh, it's had such a huge impact on our culture and our people. A lot of our stories have been lost. Um, a lot of the language has been lost and that's being reclaimed now at the moment, which is a really beautiful thing to watch. Um, even the way we exist in our bodies and sexuality, like exactly what you said about the moko, the tamoko, which is the tattoos um, being edited out of those images, um, things like that are coming back in. But before colonization and the missionaries came, it was actually quite normal for men to do the childcare work. So our men were actually really beautiful fathers and really beautiful carers. And, and that's really shifted and changed. And now in New Zealand, the majority of our prisons are Maori men. And I feel like religion and colonization has obviously very clearly been the reason why that's happened. Um, also, it was quite common for men to have relationships with men and women to have sexual relationships with women, and it wasn't a big deal, and it was okay. There were songs about that and stories written about that, but those stories and songs have been erased over the decades because of these religious ideas of what the binary role of a man and a woman should be. Mm. Um, Morgan, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just the, uh, so I'm so, the fact that you picked up on the subversiveness of of those um that kind of traumatic history but then in the in the film Josephine and Maddie are sort of dealing with this tone of actually the absurdity of a lot of it and the premise that young women are so dangerous yeah. or that people from the fringes of society are so dangerous and such a huge threat that you literally ship them off to an island to kind of quarantine them from from society and just dancing with that subversive tone was really, really tricky. And like Joe Samani just did such an amazing job of making sure that we don't like Joe's really held on to the fact that it's, it's really there's so much um, there is so much darkness there. But then actually being a teenage girl at times is lighthearted yeah, and, and beautiful it's fun and funny. And, funny. and mm. you know, I think I also really liked. In Maddie's script, she um, she highlighted the contradictions that happen in religion, mm. which are hilarious, and yeah. it's very funny. And the matron gets to embody that, mm. and we, you know, yeah. I mean, just like it's so funny. If, like I went to an all girls school, and like men and boys become this sort of like, in some ways, this like mythology <laughs> because like you're sort of like not interacting with them. But it's sort of like true for these girls. It's like men are like this great threat, but on the other hand, this great prize. Like they have, can make you pregnant, which sometimes will ruin your life. And in other contexts, like be your yeah. greatest purpose. And like the fact, like the, 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 like so they're trying to navigate all these things. And the, like, what? And the environment that you made just on set for Rima Tiwiata to play in that space of like of like embodying this earnest kind of hegemonic horrendous colonization but then be so you I mean I just want you to talk about that because I think it's so executed like wow. we just we had a lot of fun with that dialogue particularly for her and what we discussed is that the matron as an actor she can't know she's funny she can't play for the laughs it's better if Rima plays it very very earnestly 
and that she deeply believes that she can't hit the comedy beats. She kind of has to trust the script and the writing and just sit in her character and, you know, deliver the lines in a way that, um, yeah, is it, her righteousness needs to cut right through. And then it becomes funny because mm. she's suddenly she she's nonsense. Yeah, because yeah. she so desperately wants it to make sense and yeah. she really wants to be able to, like, understand it and that it will save her and that she can use it to, like, save them. But she's like... I don't think I have a good name on this thing. She just, like, that is, like, so tragic for her, like, that she has dedicated her entire self to the system that, like, cannot and it's not ever going to dedicate yeah. itself to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's absurd and ridiculous. It's absurd and ridiculous, and that's where the comedy comes in because it's the contradiction of it all. You know, you're talking about civilization and civilizing these uncivilized delinquent girls, but the actions that she takes are barbaric and violent you know like she so easily snaps them without hesitation and i'm like this is a child this is a teenager and you're you're condemning her for not being civilized for not being able to like have like etiquette you know just because she can't sit right but you're so quick to slam slap her you know she says things that she thinks are intelligent but they're really not like the scene about the potatoes where the girl's like we just got here last week like, how do you expect potatoes to be? and she's spouting off like this religiosity diatribe and i'm like nothing you're saying makes sense lady like this is impossible but then it's also like for people who like if they use the bible as a cudgel against people but they can only do that if the people they're talking to haven't read the bible or haven't understood it right and me growing up in the church and going to pentecost and seventh-day adventist church i'm very well familiar with um, with the bible and like i'm familiar with preachers who preach to people like they know what they're talking about but if you read the bible you're like you're talking utter nonsense you know, and when she says, like, Jesus wouldn't hang around with undesirable people, I'm like, that's who exactly who Jesus was hanging around with, the undesirables <laughs> of society, right? But it shows that these people, they use what they think is knowledge to to browbeat, like, those that they looked on. So the last thing I want us to talk about, because we don't have much time, is using the kind of the setting of the island as almost like a, a small test, um, testing area for the broader idea of colonization. You know, like she is like the, if you use like North America or like the Southern, like, you know, the entire world, because the, the British went all over the planet colonizing. But, you know, like I kind of looked at it as a small, um, like, test um, testing facility where they're like, this is how colonization works. You have the European settler coming with the small, with the small, with the indigenous people landing here, telling them this is what you need to do. And then gradually more and more of them come in. To do like the experiments and like figure out how to like the society is going to work so i want you um maddie and josephine to kind of like talk about making the film a, a small pocket of basically the broader idea of colonization in new zealand wow okay um i love that you had that read on the film i did not think about that when i was making it but that's really <laughs> steal it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i mean i definitely think that we sort of like there was always this idea with like things like these islands that were sort of the matron is like we're going to learn the ways so we're safe to reassimilate into society and they're sort of being like we don't think you'll ever get there like you know the the measures they take suggest that they yeah, would prefer to isolate them entirely which i think is interesting um, but yeah, like in terms of sort of like thinking about, like, it, I think every time Britain colonized a new place, it became like a new test for like all these different ideas. And it, like, I think eugenics and these schools were like one examples of all these ways in which they were like, how can we force a sim- forcibly assimilate people? And how can we like create a cultural hegemony? And it's like interesting to see like, well, to me at least like, what that looks like a hundred years down the line, like a hundred years after they've arrived. It's like they've built the institutions. They've got the first few generations. They're like trying desperately to like have a grip on the country and the culture, the people, the institutions, the ideas. And like, what does that look like at a time when it's like colonization is a little more established? Uh, it was re- super interesting to me to like learn about and to, to, yeah, to try and like get across in the film. So, I mean, the matron is so excited to come to this island in a way at the, at the beginning because this is her opportunity to do what the people that she's admired have, have done, the colonizers, because she's so, you know, 
she's so deeply ingrained. She's lost herself and she's lost herself for a really long time. And I don't know if she'll ever find herself. And that's the tragedy of her character, really. And the yeah, that's... As well, isn't it? But, you know, it's also the tragedy of her. Yeah, I'm not going to spoil it, but that's where I think the beautiful, I think the beauty in the whole film comes through in the very last scene where you got the three girls doing what they're doing and she's just there devastated, realizing, yeah. well, crap, who's free? Who really is the one that's free and who's the one that's lost, you know? Yeah. And like that to me was just like, and the performance, like her performance in that very last moment of that, it was just like, oh, like so much is happening in there. And I'm just like, oh, lady, I hope you wake up, but probably not. But, you know, like that moment is just like, wow. <laughs> but um, again, I think we have to wrap now. But thank you so much, for all three of you, for joining me today. I wish we had more time because I had way more questions. But I really appreciate this. And I love, again, like giving me a, giving me and the audience a perspective of colonization and assimilation and everything from the perspective of these young girls, especially for Maori young girls. Because for Western audiences, I don't think they don't really think about these things in in a particular way you know and I think the film is a way to help people really think like you know go and do some research go and look up and see what's happening you know and like how it's affected the community but again thank you so much for joining for joining me today great thank you for your very insightful yeah, it was a great chat yeah. thank you for your your very smart humor you're an ideal audience yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still think I had more questions because I wanted to add like for um daisy in particular she's i saw so much of me in her and was just like wow i'm like she's me <laughs> in school literally me in school i say things that the teachers would be like oh, yeah. cool <laughs> thank you so much bye have a good bye. evening bye. Bye. <laughs>